Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. It's been a fantastic evening, and I'm looking forward to the second half myself uh, very much. So did you know that your genes have a memory? This is an interesting concept. What does a genetic memory look like? Well, as we are developing as individuals and moving from the two cells, the egg and the sperm, that join together, to the 37 trillion cells that will actually inhabit the human body, a lot of things are happening. And all along the way, just like children growing up who are deciding what they want to be when they grow up, your cells are deciding what they want to be in the adult individual. Do I want to be a liver cell? Do I want to be a muscle cell? Do I want to be a heart cell? Now remember, every single cell has the exact same DNA. The genes are the same. The ones that came from mom and the ones that came from dad. But along the way, you have to commit. And once a cell commits to become a liver cell and then continues to divide as the individual grows, with every division, the daughter cells have to remember that they came from a liver cell. And they, too, have to become a liver cell. And every one of their progeny also has to remember that they are committed to become a liver cell. So how is that memory of that decision passed on faithfully, just like the genes are passed on faithfully with every cell division? Well, our cells also have a memory. It is a software that controls the programming that will tell them what type of cell they are going to be. And that software is called the epigenome. You can use an analogy of a computer, and it works beautifully. The genes that you get from mom and dad are like the hardware of your computer. You bought a Mac, or you bought a PC, you bought a tablet. Whatever you have, what we know and understand is what makes the computer work is the software. The epigenome is the software that controls the function of the genome. And very much like software, the epigenome is actually also a code of small chemical modifications that are made to the DNA during this programming stage. So when exactly do the cells get this epigenetic software? Development is the main period of time when we are going from that two-cell stage to the adult individual that the vast majority of this epigenetic programming is being installed. So as you might imagine, this is a very, very important time and is the time that once a commitment is made to be a certain type of cell, that epigenetic programming decision is made, the program is installed, and then it continues along through the life of that cell and that cell's progeny and their progeny as well. So how exactly does this epigenetic programming work? If you look at DNA that is in our chromosomes, it's DNA combined with proteins that make up the chromatin. And what we know is that these small chemical modifications can be added to the DNA itself, or they can be added to the proteins that are intimately linked with the DNA that make up the chromatin of our chromosomes. So if we understand what the code looks like, well, who are the programmers? We have now identified many, many proteins that act as the readers, the writers, and the erasers of the epigenetic software. So the writers, for example, are the enzymes that actually come and add these small chemical modifications at just the right place to now control which genes will ultimately be turned on or which genes will be turned off. And the readers, these are very, very important proteins because every time that cell divides, the readers are responsible for faithfully copying that epigenetic program into the progeny cells. And then, also, there are the erasers. So during development, an amazing thing happens. When the sperm and the egg come together and join to form the embryo, their epigenetic memory that they were a sperm or they were an egg is completely wiped away. And then during development, as these decisions are being made to become muscle cells or brain cells or skin cells, 
the new programming is installed. And how that happens remains one of the greatest mysteries in biology. But the point is, to make the epigenetic programming work, we need all three. We need the writers, we need the raisers, and we need the readers. So, the installation of this epigenetic programming is sometimes termed developmental programming because it occurs during the process of development. But we also know that this programming can be influenced by our environment. What do I mean by that? So early on in the 60s, for example, we learned that the exposure to certain chemicals or drugs could cause congenital abnormalities that would have lifelong consequences for the exposed individuals. The drug thalidomide that caused severe and horrendous limb malformations that was given in some cases to pregnant women. We know that if you don't have enough folate in your diet, your offspring can have spina bifida. And we know that drinking during pregnancy can cause neurological abnormalities. So we have actually known for a long time that early environmental life had a profound influence on our health throughout the life course. Now we learned some other very fascinating things in the 80s. And what we learned in the 80s was the following, that this period of development, mostly in utero, but for some tissues even early in childhood, is actually sensing the environment and pre-positioning us to be successful adults in that environment. Now, what do I mean by that? For example, a pregnant woman is starved. As a result of that, in utero, the fetus is also starved of nutrients. And in fact, what will happen is that fetus will develop differently than a fetus in a nutrient-rich environment. They're going to have a smaller muscle mass, so you're going to need less food as an adult to sustain that. The liver is going to make glucose differently so that you can survive in time of starvation. Even your fat is developing differently. And so the infant that is gestating and then born into a starvation environment actually has a survival advantage because they are built to survive without nutrients. Now, what we are learning now in the 2015 era at the molecular level is how this is happening. And how this is happening is by changes in the programming of the epigenome. So there's a wonderful example that happens to be the favorite one of my sister, who's in the audience tonight. And this is the example of a mother and her pups. Now the best data is actually from experimental animal models, but we have good data that similar things happen in people. A good mother rat licks and grooms her pups all the time. And in fact, the rats that grow up in that nurturing environment as adults are much calmer, they're able to handle stress better, and in fact, they will tend to lick and groom their pups. On the other hand, if the mother is not so nurturing, those pups are very stressed and then will turn out to be worse parents themselves. This is because the process of licking and grooming is actually affecting the epigenetic program that's being laid down in the brain of those pups while the mother is caring for them. But this Developmental programming is a double-edged sword. Let's go back to the example of an individual that is developing in utero in a starvation situation. Now, if that starvation environment has been caused by famine, or in the case of the Nazi blockade of the Netherlands in World War II, when that child is born, they will actually face this environment that is nutrient depleted, and they will have a survival advantage. But what if there's a disconnect between how we are programmed in utero and the actual environment that we see as an adult? And so there are instances where there is a poor maternal in utero environment. The individual who's developing in that environment is developing ready for a starvation situation when they're born, only now they land in an environment of plenty. So you can imagine a mother who perhaps doesn't eat well or for various uh, reasons. There's poor nutrient supply in the placenta to the uh, infant that's developing in utero. But the environment is quite rich in nutrients. This disconnect does not work. 
And in fact, now this individual that's been programmed for a starvation environment finds themselves in an environment of plenty, and they are at hugely increased risk for metabolic diseases, obesity, uh, diabetes, a disease we know now as metabolic syndrome. And so this is a double-edged sword. So the advantage for us to be sensing and programming through our environment creates a vulnerability. And if now that exposure is inconsistent with the environment, or if the exposure is to an environmental chemical, now in fact the programming can be disrupted. This has given rise to a whole field of research which is called the developmental basis of health and disease. And basically this DOHAD hypothesis says to us that things that we may have been exposed to in utero or early in childhood are potentially programming us in a way decades later will have an impact on our health as adults. What this says is that these environmental exposures will actually leave a fingerprint, much like an intruder entering your house on your epigenome. And because, as I told you, this epigenetic programming, once it's in place, it's faithfully passed on. In fact, the disrupted epigenetic programming caused by environmental exposures to can be passed on to the progeny of cells and then carried for an individual across their life. So what are some examples of exposures that we know can do this? One example is the drug diethylsvelbesterol. Some of you may have heard of this drug. It's often called DES. It was actually given to women to avert miscarriage. What we found, however, was especially in the daughters of those women who took this drug, that they were born with reproductive tract abnormalities, but then in early adulthood, they suddenly had tremendously high incidences of an incredibly rare cancer that was almost never seen. And that was because of that early exposure to the diethylstilbestrol that had reprogrammed their epigenome. Now, not all of the environmental exposures that we know now can have a difference. And by the way, I should note, not every reprogramming that occurs from our environment is going to have an adverse health effect. So I told you an example of where, in a starvation environment, that programming could actually give you a survival advantage. And so I'm going to give you examples of where we know about the adverse health effects. But remember, there could be very positive things happening as well. So the next example I want to show you is a phytoestrogen called genistein. Soy, which is something that is a wonderful nutrient, has a compound in it called genistein that mimics the female hormone estrogen. And we know now that early life exposures to genistein as well can also reprogram the epigenome. So here's an example of a drug of something in our natural environment. And some of you may have heard of this one, bisphenol A. You see your water bottles. Bisphenol A is a plasticizer, and it's back now being taken out of commercial use in many countries because of the fact that bisphenol A, which, to which we are ubiquitously exposed, is also one of these environmental chemicals that has been shown in experimental studies to be able to reprogram the epigenome early in life. And these particular environmental exposures have all been linked, at least in experimental studies, to early life exposures and increased incidence in adulthood of cancer, of heart disease, of obesity, and diabetes. So let's talk a little bit about the obesity epidemic. We all hear about it. I look in the audience. I notice it's not so epidemic here in this crowd, which is wonderful. But you will often see these maps where you can look at how much obesity was present in this country in the early 90s compared to where we are with obesity now. It's rather frightening. And there are a lot of reasons why this may be happening. And the finger is very often pointed at our lack of exercise. Kids aren't walking to school. We're all eating fast food too much. And, and this is all probably true. But what individuals studying the DOHAD hypothesis will point out, that this trend also mimics environmental exposures to many chemicals that would have been occurring in individuals who are obese today during their early childhood life. I don't know how many of you out there remember the DDT trucks spraying the neighborhood for mosquitoes as you were growing up, but growing up in Dallas, I certainly do remember that. So it's at least an open question, and it is certainly controversial, but there is a lot of good evidence to suspect 
that some of the obesity epidemic may actually have been caused by our early life environmental exposures. And the fact that this uh, epidemic is now leveling off and perhaps even starting to drop also happens to coincide with our appreciation of the need to remove many of these environments for chemicals and so we prevent our exposures. So, early life exposures can change the epigenome. Those epigenetic changes can be carried with us throughout our life. We know that they can have adverse health effects and perhaps they can even be a biomarker to identify those individuals who were exposed early in life had these reprogramming events happen, and now we can perhaps intervene in them selectively to try to prevent disease occurring. But is that all we can do? In fact, is it possible that we could actually reverse the damage that had been done? And in fact, we know, for example, that this may be possible. Because unlike mutations in DNA that cause diseases like cancer, the epigenome, the readers, writers, and erasers are still around. And perhaps we can activate them once again to restore normal programming. We know, for example, that many of the foods in our diet actually carry epigenetically modifiable drugs that can come and talk to our epigenome. And early studies suggest that dietary interventions can actually reset the program and now decrease the risk for disease in individuals that had early life exposures that put them at increased risk. Here's an example of that. Here's another laboratory study where I show you a yellow mouse on one side that was obese and cancer prone. And her progeny is right next door. And what was the difference? The difference was the diet that the progeny had growing up that now made a difference and decreased both the obesity and their risk for developing cancer. 